Hi guys, so today's video is going to be a non-spoiler book review for Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter. This is probably one of my most tabbed books that I've ever read, and uh, most most of these tabs are uh, not exactly positive. So I really loved what I think the author's intentions were with this story. In this particular world, the setting, we follow a colonialist, very militaristic society. They're a caste system based off of the military, where you rank within it, and also your blood. So some of it you have control over, but a lot of it you have no control over because if you're born into one of the lower classes, you just have only so far that you can go and then your options for life are stopped there. Our main character is not at the very bottom of the caste system, but they are a part of one of the lower classes. So they see a lot of the inequality that exists within their society. What is very interesting and also somewhat ironic is because they are a colonialist society, they actually, their ancestors came to this particular island and they were like, yo, all you indigenous people, you're savages, you're heathens, this is my island now. And the indigenous people were like, um, no, actually we're gonna defend it. And they're like, you guys are savages for wanting to defend your own land. So it's very interesting that that mindset has existed within this society, despite the fact that you have members of the society who see the fact that it's not very fair that people judge you for something that's outside of your control, but then you find that the character himself and some of the other characters who are a part of these lower classes still feel this way about the native people of this land. And I actually, while it was uncomfortable every time the word savage came up in the book, while something like that was uncomfortable, I also think it's very interesting to approach a story where pretty much the entire society that your main character is a part of Eh, not exactly a part of the uh, the heroic group of people. So I did like that right away you are set up with some moral ambiguity and our main character does fit into that a little bit because of the fact that their mindset isn't exactly that progressive. Part of the reason that their society is so military based is because they are still in a way at, at war with the native people. Our main character Tao decides that he really does not want to be a part of the military. He just wants to have a nice little quaint life. He wants to get a girl, settle down, have a family, and be happy. He doesn't condone violence, really. He's not really interested in proving he's the best of the best. His plans are completely thwarted, however, when the inequality among the classes really shows up because somebody he cares about is killed and now he wants revenge. Despite having no prior desires to prove himself really among the military, now he sees that this is essentially his opportunity to become strong enough so that he can pursue revenge against the people that killed the person that he loved. And right around this one orange tab, this is the beginning of the book, Around there is when the training starts and it pretty much goes throughout the rest of the book. If you are not a fan of training sequences and if you're not a fan of a lot of fight scenes, you are probably not going to be interested in this story. With training sequences, I do feel like the stakes are slightly lower. They're not as high because ultimately it's about the character getting stronger. So the stakes can only be elevated to a certain point. I do think that Evan Winter managed to find where those points were to a degree because some of the people are actually injured within these practice skirmishes, within these, these practice sequences. So you are going to find there are instances where the stakes are there, but there are just so many action scenes, so many fight scenes, and so many of them are based in training that it's not quite the same as a story where the action kind of surprises you. It's not a story where it's a it's a battle that you've been leading up to and this is this is it. This is the big moment. It's not really like that. And so for me, I didn't love that element of the story, but I do think it plays such a huge role in the character's mm, I was about to say character development, but it's more like the character uh Dis descent. Our main character Tao, the event that led him to want revenge is clearly weighing on him. I think that the author's intentions with this particular character was to show somebody struggling with PTSD. And that is 
essentially enabled through their militaristic society because he is so often relying on self-sabotage. He is doing things that are incredibly unhealthy for his mental health. He is aware of it at times, but then he tricks himself into thinking, this is just you being weak. This is just you wanting to give up. You have to get revenge. And then he continues to do things that are very unhealthy for him. However, he is often seeing rewards from the outside and literally verbally people are starting to praise him people are looking at him with adoration because they're like wow you're just so you're so driven what what is causing you to be this driven you're an inspiration to us especially because he is of the lower classes he's starting to see a lot of other people who are a part of the lower classes seeing him as heroic, seeing him as somebody who is breaking down these boundaries between the classes. And all of this is feeding into this unhealthy thing that he is not able to heal from. He's really not able to get help. And I think all of that, that whole concept, I think is pretty brilliant. I think that the execution and the intention is I mean, it's, it is kind of tragic in a sense, and not in a sense, it is tragic to see somebody who so clearly needs help and they can't get it because their society is built on the very thing that, that this character is doing that's unhealthy. Despite loving that element of the story and loving that setup and really enjoying the, the way that Evan Winter has broken up this cast system, which I, I think he has put so much care into, despite all of that, I am such a character-driven reader, and I hated Tao. I couldn't stand him to the point where I'm like, can this guy just kind of, I don't know, fail? I just was so frustrated because I will follow a character who is, is falling into a villainous role, or I will follow a character who is extremely morally gray if I find them interesting, if I find them entertaining, if I find them fascinating in some fashion, or if I can see the the thing before the person they were before or the event that kind of made them change if i can see a lot of that thing before then i have this strong emotional connection where it really makes me sad to see them falling into this tao was just so not interesting for me because of the fact that he was so single-minded and he was just like, I must get revenge. I must get revenge. And then sometimes he would start to kind of shift where you're like, oh, is this character growth? Because he's like, actually, the class system is messed up. And if I can just prove to everybody that the lower classes can be among the higher classes, then I will have a purpose. There, This will all mean something. And you're like, okay, you're seeing something beyond you. And then later he's like, I don't freaking care about changing the system. I just want revenge. And you're like, gosh darn it. And I think that was intentional. I think that that's kind of the point is that he's just saying whatever he needs to say. He's just doing whatever he needs to do to feed into this, this pursuit that he has. But it was so aggravating because I, I didn't feel like the earlier parts of the book and the person that he loses that causes all of this to happen. I didn't see a lot of their relationship. I didn't really get to know the character that he lost all that well. And I didn't really feel like I got to know Tao that well. And I didn't really like him that much before all this happened. And granted, you know, you don't want books to be a thousand pages long all the time so that you can get to know a character super, super well. So that then when they start to fall, it's like such a tearjerker. We don't have the time necessarily. But in this particular story, we spent so much time with the training that I kind of felt, because that's not my taste as much, that you could have kind of cut down the training a little bit and then maybe put a little bit more into the earlier parts. That's not going to be appealing <laughs> to a lot of other people. A lot of other people, they want to get to the action. They want to get to the revenge. They don't want to spend a bunch of time following this quaint little lower class boy who just wants to live a peaceful life. They don't really want to follow that. That's not the most exciting. It's not the most interesting. It's not the thing that really makes it fast paced for most other people. I just love to sit with characters and get to know characters and really feel for them so that when they start to fall, if that's the route that a book is going, which I think that's what this one was doing, when that happens, then I'm like, come on, you can do it. I know how you were before. And I just, I didn't really feel like that. Also, I personally, I can't keep rooting for a character when they put other people in danger continuously because 
then I'm just like, okay, well now you're just selfish and they're not interesting enough for me because again, it's just like, I just want, I want revenge. I want revenge. And if that's your, your character, then when they start to, in their pursuit of revenge, harm other people, put other people in harm's way, I don't care about the revenge anymore. Revenge plot lines for me are sometimes some of the best because if you can really make me feel that desire for revenge, if you can make me hate the person that they're trying to get revenge on, then I'm 100% there, especially if I like the character. And I think that a lot of times revenge stories are just so successful. It's so easy to have it be obviously something where a character is struggling with the morality of it. But that... Tao is really not. He's really not struggling with the morality throughout the story. And again, I think that's because of how the society is kind of encouraging this behavior. He's being uplifted in a lot of ways. So he doesn't really even see what he's doing. But as the reader, it's so aggravating. I have a few specific parts that I'm going to read to you that I think illustrate this pretty clearly. There's a scene where he is talking to somebody he cares about and he's explaining in this particular line, this little statement is pretty awesome in and of itself. But with the other things I'm going to read to you, you can see what I mean by he just, he flip flops all the time for whatever he wants because he's kind of becoming very selfish. So in this particular part, he's talking about the class system and how he wants a better world. He's done with this idea that the only reason the people on top are on top is because the people at the bottom think that they belong there and those people are essentially building off of the backs of the lower classes. So this particular line says, if I can be better than them, then any of us can be. The nobles, they are great because we are on our knees. No more. I choose to stand. However, very shortly after this, there are talks throughout the book about whether or not they should try to just wipe out the native people, if they should continue this war with them, or if they should try and have peace with them. And so he's kind of contemplating what would peace look like with these people. So really quick, just to give you an, some context for this passage I'm about to read, uh, his group of people are the Omehi, and then there's a few different instances of the different military groups based off of the classes that you're going to hear me mention but uh, I don't know how to pronounce them because I didn't listen to the audiobook. So I'm really sorry for those that did. And you're like, you're saying it all wrong. But it says, what would happen to the Omehi military when you counted the Ihagu, Ihashi, and Enlovu? One in six chosen men were soldiers. Chosen society was built around the military, around defense, survival. With peace, what would his people become? What would the nobles become? As far as Tao knew, the Hedini did not have castes. Under peace, would royal nobles be subject to the same rules, opportunities, and failures as a low common. Peace, Tao thought, would destroy the Omehi. This passage is essentially a contradiction to the other part where Tao was speaking about no more, no more with this caste system. And then he's thinking about what would peace look like with the Hidini, which are the native people. He's like, I don't even think they have caste. So like, what would happen to our military? It would probably fall apart. And and then if we had peace, it would, it would completely ruin my people. And I'm like, <laughs> That actually, based off what you said before, you should want you should want this. Don't you want the break the caste system down? And then the third passage I wanted to point out, Tao is arguing with another person that he's been training with. They are arguing because there are certain instances throughout the book where they have the opportunity to prove that lessers are capable. And they're arguing about something Tao did that could potentially jeopardize how people view the lessers because they've had these opportunities. And Tao's like, screw these opportunities because his friend's calling him out on it. And he says, I'm not looking to change the chosen. So dude, what? It's so frustrating to have a character just flip flop, flip flop, because while I think that's intentional, it is crazy frustrating and it makes it so that I don't want to root for you especially when you're so dogged in your pursuit you're screwing things up for other people not to mention Tao is kind of an idiot he is really stupid a lot of the time so one particular instance early in the story he is he kind of like sneaks up on this person that he wants revenge on and the person catches him and then he's like ha huh, and the person kind of getting ready to defend himself and Tao is like, I'm not here to kill you. I'm here to tell you how I'm going to kill you. It's basically that cheesy moment when the villain in a story is like, I'm going to tell you my master plan. And then it gives the hero time to escape. And you're like, well, the only reason the hero got away with 
you know, their life is because the villain was so dumb. And Tao is basically doing that because he's like, I'm not here to kill you. I'm here to just run my mouth. I don't know why he did that. He had the opportunity. He has an opportunity. And he's like, I'm not going to use this opportunity. I'm just going to tell you my master plan. And that was really frustrating because I'm like, dude, do you want revenge or not? If you have the opportunity, go for it. And I won't tell you how, of course, that part, that part goes about. But then not too long after, I'm like, okay, so his plan is to make the people that he wants revenge against, he wants them to sit and wait. That's kind of what he's established with this particular scene early on. Like, he's going to get so good, they're going to be quaking in their boots. Except, evidently, not. Because later, there's a part where there's a bunch of people around. A lot of people. And it's not like he's... It's not like way later when he's got lots of training and he's really strong or anything. It's like he doesn't know anything really yet. And he sees one of the people that he wants revenge on. He's like, hmm, there's a huge crowd of people, but that guy's right there. So I'm just going to go for it. And then he sees some guards coming after him. And he's like, I better hustle. And you're like, what do you, what? Like earlier, you had an opportunity to harm somebody, to kill somebody that you really want revenge against. And you're like, I'm actually just going to talk to them. And then this time you're surrounded by people where you're probably going to die if you do try to get revenge right now. And you're like, I'm going to take this chance. And then there's another instance in the story. There's a paragraph, a whole paragraph. And it's really cool because he sees somebody he wants revenge on. And it's like, he's like a snake in the grass. They'll never know he's there until the last minute and then then they'll know as they're taking their last breath that's kind of like a summary of this paragraph and he's sneaking up on them he's sneaking up on them and you're like yeah you can do it and then he just shouts their name from it says 20 strides away and you're like dude why why would you do that it just doesn't make any sense because when he has opportunities he's like let me just screw up my entire opportunity and then when he really doesn't have a good opportunity or when his opportunity is gonna harm a bunch of other people he's like now i'm gonna now i'm gonna go through with it and then then he goes back to now you have an opportunity and he's like now i'm gonna screw this up it's like ah, he's just so frustrating because he's just he's dumb he's so dumb what i would have really liked in the story because I think Tao is allowed to be stupid. He's because he's just he's not really thought through what he's doing. It makes sense for him to be foolish a lot of the times. However, it's aggravating as the reader when you finally see the character have opportunities and you're like, are you gonna do it, man? And then he's like, Mah! and he just like goes into rage mode, rage of dragons, and you're just like, oh geez, all right. So what I think would have been for me, with my personal taste, what would have what would have really made this work so well is if we'd had stronger multiple points of view because every now and then you get a point of view of some other character and they were pretty sparse. We don't have a lot of them. So I wouldn't really consider this a multiple point of view story. I would say it's pretty much single point of view with the occasional little thing sprinkled in, a, a chapter here and there. What I would have really liked is because the world that he's created is so interesting. And there are other characters that are involved with the politics. There are other characters that are involved with other parts of the magic in their world. And those characters seemed interesting. I also think that there's the characters that are, they're not really, they're not really characters, but there are people who are a part of the natives of this land that at some point Tao kind of interacts with. So what I think would have been amazing is if this had been maybe four to five points of view. Tao could have been one of them. I would not have minded if when we went back to Tao, we see him declining. We see him kind of becoming so elevated by his society that he's losing sight of his own mental health. I think that the training sequences, then it would have been like, oh, well, time has passed because we've visited other characters. So when you come back to him, you can see some of these training sequences be a fantastic opportunity to kind of break up the pace with these moments. And you would have got to see the military side of this world. And then one of the characters who I so wished we'd had a strong point of view from is one of the characters that there's more than meets the eye. It's one of the characters he wants revenge on. And that character is kind of involved with the politics would have been so cool even if it was just a dual perspective story and you follow these two characters one who wants revenge on this one one who you get to know and you get to like but then you see like them stuck in the upper classes i would have really liked that there's also the character's love interest in the story i would have loved to have a perspective 
a more uh to have her presence be more independent from Tao because she was learning things to do with the magic and a lot of times when we saw her she was kind of like a person who would let us know the world building a little bit, or I think it could have been slightly more organic if we were just learning alongside her rather than when she's interacting with Tao. Then Tao is like, that's like their conversation is her being like, here's how the magic works. And then, like I said, if there had been one of the natives, if they had had a perspective, I think that would have added so much to the world and the complexities of the way that this colonialist setup has messed with everything because, like I showed, Tao, despite hating the caste system, even thinks like, well, it's better than having peace with these people. So I think it would have been really cool to actually see one of their perspectives. I also think there's a character who is, uh, she's like the new queen, and I wanted that perspective too because there's some other things going on behind the scenes that because Tao is kind of just in the military training all the time, that certain things that are going on behind the scenes, they affect things later in the book. And they didn't have as big of an impact as I would have wanted because it was kind of just like, surprise! And, and there wasn't really a lot of, a ton of setup where we could have had more things hinted at, I think. Complexities of the politics could have been a lot more present, but of course, all of this is personal taste. Not, uh, none of what I've described is a matter of bad, terrible writing or terrible storytelling. It's that I am such a character-driven reader that when I get frustrated with a character, I just get frustrated <laughs> and we're stuck with Tao pretty much the whole book and I was so aggravated with him so much. But like I said, the examination of a character who's clearly dealing with some heavy stuff and then to have a society that feeds into that, I think that's a fantastic premise. One last thing I want to know, I know a lot of people when they go to adult fantasy, not only are they looking for these maybe heavier themes, but often they are looking maybe for a certain kind of writing style. And I'm a big fan of Brandon Sanderson and I know there are some people that one of their biggest gripes with Sanderson is that his writing is pretty straight forward. In the story, you are getting incredibly straightforward writing. I think it's to the benefit of the story because that one passage I read to you, you can clearly hear. <laughs> there's a lot of different terms. The cast system, there's a lot to take in with that. And so I think it serves the book very well. But if you are somebody who likes a very beautiful writing or a very poetic writing, you like the prose to just be the most gorgeous thing you've ever read, I don't think that that's uh, the main focus of this book. Let me know your thoughts on this story. I hope that you enjoy it if you pick it up. If you have picked it up, I hope that you have loved it. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you guys later.